Right now, a leaked memo outlines the government's guidelines for when drones can be used to kill even American citizens, let alone enemies of the state. Have we inadvertently stepped into the future? And what happened to due process? We'll get into all those sticky questions. And next, which members of Congress are gun owners? Are you curious to know? And do you think in any way that clouds their decision on what gun control ought to look like? We'll have more on that as well. And later, Carl Walt Rove, he is waging war again, but this time it's on members of his own party, specifically the Tea Party. If you're surprised, we'll tell you why you shouldn't be. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French, and thanks so much for joining us this Tuesday evening, February 5th. And we're going to begin with the changing face of warfare and what exactly the rules ought to be. Now, the big issue are this. Drone aircraft that can spot, identify, target, and attack locations or people, and all from the other side of the world. The U.S. has invested heavily in drone aircraft, and it's easy to see why. A drone can take the place of a whole team of soldiers or special forces, and they can attack arguably even more precisely with less collateral damage sometimes. They're less expensive, and they don't kill American soldiers when they basically kill from above. And perhaps one of the most compelling selling points is they allow for complicated and dangerous attacks, as I said, without spilling American blood. All right. But the question is, what if the person we're targeting with a drone also happens to be an American? Well, that is one of the many questions that's been burning up the phones of the Pentagon today after a White House memo on the subject got leaked to reporters. And for more, I want to bring in our senior political correspondent, Andrew Whitman. And we're going to say right off the bat, we've got a panel here, and a, and a guest will bring him in. This isn't an easy one, I think. This is complicated. It's the reality of the times we live in, the reality of what is now modern warfare. But think about it, if, we're, if you're targeting an American on American soil for criminal things, you send the police, you investigate, you read them their rights, you hold them to a trial. Overseas, the, the questions are a lot murkier, and specifically using a drone, there really aren't any rules in place, Rich. And in fact, there are very few rules that cover drone strikes at all and no clear governing laws, but with several Americans having turned up in terror plots and investigations, the Obama White House did put together some informal rules governing how they conduct drone strikes on American targets. It's assumed this only covers Americans being targeted overseas and not on American soil, but there's nothing specific in the paper governing that. Right now, the order to kill an American with a drone strike can come from, quote, an informed high-level official of the U.S. government. Note that does not specify the president, and it doesn't need to be okayed by a judge either. Americans can be targeted if they have been recently involved in activities posing a threat of violent attack, assuming there is no evidence that, um, that that American has renounced or abandoned terror activities. But note the vague wording. Recently, activities and evidence None of those are defined in these rules and could be, we assume, applied or not applied as needed. There are some added safeguards in place because these targets are Americans, but really not that many. That American must pose an imminent threat. Capturing the target must be considered infeasible, but that can mean a capture mission would pose an undue risk to U.S. troops. And the attack must be conducted according to, quote, law of war principles. Then again, given drone strikes are uncovered by the laws of war as they're established now, Rich, it's not exactly clear what that would mean. All right, we're going to bring in a guest in a moment to help explain that, but help me if we know them, Andrew, with the numbers. How many are we talking about with these drone strikes, and how many suspected bad guys, terrorists, have we got? Well, well first of all, there's only one clear case where an American has been targeted, so I want to set that aside, but since drone strikes have been used for the first time in Yemen in 2002, they've been used more and more and more under President Obama than under President Bush. Since 9-11, 95% of all targeted U.S. killings, targeting a person and not a location, that's been done by drone. Our busiest year for drone strikes was 2010. We used them more than 100 times in Pakistan. There have already been seven drone strikes in Pakistan in the first five weeks of this year. Best information, we've killed more than 3,000 terror suspects via the drone, with only between 261 and 891 civilians killed in those attacks. But there's a huge caveat in that number. Washington reportedly counts any military-aged male killed in a drone strike as a militant. So if there's one known suspect in a group of 10 other men and all 11 are killed, they're all reportedly considered militants, even if they're not, Rich. Okay, I know you said in their high level, um, who makes the call here? Are we clear who gets to say yes or no? You know, there are actually two different sets of rules in place right now, depending on where the attack order comes from. 
both the military and the CIA are authorized to conduct drone strikes. In the military, the strike order is supposed to go through several steps in the chain of command, ending up with the Homeland Security Advisor and then the President, but that's for the military. For the CIA to initiate a drone strike, only the director of the CIA needs to sign off. No one else. Not the military, not Homeland Security. Rich, not even the President of the United States. All right, Andrew, thank you. And for more on this, I want to bring in our first guest, Faisal Patel from the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. And Faisal is the co-director of their Liberty and National Security Program, which focuses its work on preserving both human rights and freedoms in the fight against terror. And uh, you can help me out here because I gave this a reading um, and in my very bare legal mind, I still don't get um, what is high level and what is imminent threat. Is that in the eye of the beholder, I guess? Well, I mean, I think the previous speaker pointed out a little bit the different uh, concepts of what a high-level approval is. Now, the issue of whether somebody constitutes an imminent threat is one of the big glaring loopholes in this memo, because the memo sets it out to sound like the fact that somebody is an imminent threat to the United States is going to be a high threshold for the government to have to meet. In fact, when you look at the circumstances in which someone is considered an imminent threat, you realize that that's actually just a straw man and a very wide range of things would be considered an imminent threat under uh, this memo. It's not like what we think about when we think of imminent threat. We think of, you know, a guy waving a gun, you know, somebody about to shoot you, somebody preparing or getting ready to prepare a terrorist plot. This is a much broader range of activity that would be covered uh, under this memo. Now, I know the memo, it's just a white paper here. It's not a legal document, but their clear reading of it is we don't have to go to a court, and by that I mean any court, including the Supreme Court here, this is basically a military operation, and whether it's the president, commander-in-chief, i.e., or uh, CIA director, they get to decide, and they don't have to check. Are the checks and balances really as plain as that reading? They don't got to go to Congress. They don't have to, like I said, the legislative or even the judicial branch, they decide on their own. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems with the drone program, which is that the administration is judge, jury, and ex executioner. The administration doesn't have to go and prove to a judge that a U.S. citizen that it suspects of terrorism is actually conducting those activities and is actually a threat to U.S. interests. Similarly, Congress has been screaming for oversight of the drone program. Senators have written 12 letters asking the administration for its legal justification of the drone program. And this is the first time that the administration has come forward with a, even a semi-formal document that purports to set out its legal justification. So, indeed, there is basically no oversight of this drone program outside of the administration. And if you ask me, that really uh, contradicts our constitutional system where we do have a system of checks and balances where the framers of our Constitution recognize that you don't want too much power to adhere to one branch of government and so shared power amongst the different branches of government and you don't see that being respected in this memo at all one last thing uh, we read through it here can you get any clarification as it relates to it's one thing if they were going to do this in Damascus could they do this in Detroit too in the reading of this document, is there a distinction between foreign soil and U.S. soil if it's deemed to be an imminent threat here um, against U.S. security? Well, I mean, the memo by its own terms says it governs the use of lethal force in a foreign country. So by its very terms, I would assume that this memo would not apply to Detroit, but would apply to Damascus, as you said. All right. Um, obviously, many more questions still ahead. Faisal Patel, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. We jump to a break here, but when we come back, we're going to bring in our panel to discuss this, both on the ethics of this, the legality and the morality of using drone strikes on American citizens. Now, we get in these murky waters, and where do we draw the line? And I'll tell you right up front. I'm conflicted on this thing. We don't need to have committee meetings every time we have a al-Qaeda target in our sights. But at the same end, are you ready to give that amount of unchecked power um, with really no checks and balances? We'll be right back with more on that after this.